In this video, we will be talking about um, phase domain circuit analysis or circuit analysis in a phase domain. Um, and but before we get there, just do a quick review of some of the things we've talked about in the past. Here we have um, a time domain uh, signal. We this is how we represent it. We represent it as x of t equal to x m m cosine of omega t plus v. That same thing can go into phasor domain, which is we represent it as a complex number. Here we can even represent it in a phasor. I'm sorry, a polar form, rectangular form, or angular form. But the basis for all of those is really this diagram, which is of called a phasor diagram, and it shows um, shows the in this case the signal x of m or x of in this case x in uh, phasor domain as a vector uh, with an angle this can be reflected on the real axis which is the horizontal axis and you get the real value or can be reflected on the imaginary axis and get the imaginary value now um, the we've talked in, in the past about the relationship between v and i uh, for each of the passive devices R, uh, resistor, inductor, and uh, um, capacitors. And as you might recall, V of T for resistor is just simply V equal Ri. For an inductor is L dI dT. And for, uh, for a capacitor, I is equal to C dV dT. So um, those relationships became just a simple algebraic relationship when we went to a phasor domain. And we said, okay, Z is defined, the impedance is defined as voltage in phasor domain divided by current in phasor domain. And we proved in earlier uh, video that Z for a resistor is just simply R, Z for an in, in, uh, inductor is J omega L, and Z for a capacitor is 1 over J omega C. By the way, J from the bottom can move to the top and becomes minus J by simply... Since j is the square root of minus 1, you can multiply the top and the bottom with my with j, and that's what uh, shows you how you can go from 1 over j omega c to minus j omega c. So that's done. Now let's go ahead and take some of these things we've learned and apply it to the circuit. You might ask, why not just then analyze this particular circuit who wants us to find the i of x in time domain. You could do that and you can write the differential equation, solve the differential equation, but in this, many of these cases, uh, first of all, differential equation may not have a closed solution, so you have to approximate, or, um, and also it'll take uh, quite a bit of doing to find the answer to your equation and write the equation. On the other hand, if you use the techniques you've learned, and take this circuit to a phasor domain, solve it in phasor domain, and then bring the answer back into time domain, you've pretty much done uh, the job. So let's say in this particular example, they're asking you to find I, I of X in time domain in the following circuit when the, when the circuit is in a steady state. So it's really important for you to have steady state given to you. It's very important that all the sources in the circuit have the same frequency because we are at this the level, we're not gonna deal with circuits that have multiple frequencies, so just have that frequency. So we know in this case, omega is equal to 2000 radian per second. Now, uh, so, so now what we have to do is at the very first step in the process, step one, and this is going to get a little messy, but I'll do it up there. Uh, step one is we need to convert all elements to phasor. Okay. Difficulty we call it, this, this process is called phasor transformation. Okay, so phasor transforms. What does that mean? Basically, we've, we've earlier discussed that this, uh, we only have to remember the phase shift and remember the uh, maximum because if you have those two, the frequency is constant, so we don't have to worry about it. So this we will write as 20 angle zero degree. If you write in an rectangular form, this will be 20 plus J zero, but we don't write it. 
and then we have to convert this element this element is an inductor l is that so we'll write it as j omega l which is going to be 100 millihenry multiplied by 2000 so when we multiply all of that together we will find out that the answer is j 200 so that's the z this is the z for this particular case well the resistors don't really change z and r of the resistor is the same so the z for this case will be 1000 okay for this one z is basically equal to 1 over j omega c so if you plug omega as 2000 and c as 0.1 times 10 to the minus 6 you will find out the answer is minus j 5000 okay and then if we were to um, take these two and do the same thing you will find that this would be 20 millihenry times 2000 so it would be j um, 40 and these all the units either whether i write it or not all the units here are ohms and this is a voltage so it would be and then the five would be again this z would be one over j omega c we have the c we have the omega we plug it in there and we'll find out that the answer is minus j 100 we can actually add these together minus j 100 and that gives us minus j 60 and 20 ohm just simply stays as 20 ohm this got this got really messy so let's let's it's always a good idea when you convert it you really want to redraw your circuit in the resistor okay. oh i just noticed that i forgot to convert this this is basically going to be 100 angle pi over 4 and if I write this in a rectangular form, it's going to be 100 times cosine of pi over 2, which is 747, tell plus j times sine of pi over 4, which is 70.7. Okay, and this is really Okay, so, so we got this going. Now, all we have to do is basically... Uh, follow this through and uh, uh, see where we end up. Uh, so, um, uh, let's redraw the circuit now that we've done. So, we've got the voltage source here. And the voltage source is just simply 20. There's no imaginary portion to it. The inductor, the Z for the inductor from up here is J. 200 ohm then the capacitor here is minus j 5000 and then we've got a resistor here that is 1000 ohm then we've got a current source which we calculated to be 70.7 plus J 70.7 milliamps and then we have an inductor now in this gets interesting how do you draw this a lot of times because half half of it came from a capacitor half of it these guys cancel each other's effect so you really need to have a capacitor and you really have a mix of everything usually we kind of give up and draw a little box and inside the box we write minus j60 so we don't you know after you, this has happened you really don't know whether it was a how much of a capacitor how much of an inductor was just you know that the sum of the two gave you minus 60 and of course we have the resistor here we drawing it again 20 and this is ix so now we've done step number two is all the techniques you learn from analyzing a resistive circuit all of them apply here so so you have to decide of all the techniques so just as a 
memory refresher, what were the techniques? Well, we had the mesh current method, or, or aka K, uh, C, KVL. We had the node voltage method, aka KCL. And we had source transformation. We have superposition. We have Thevenin equivalent. We have Norton equivalent. On and on and on. Every technique learned in the resistive circuit applies here as well. So we just got to look at it. I believe there are multiple of these that would help us do that. Specifically, both these general, general approaches would do that. And they're about the same amount of work. I'm kind of leaning toward um, mesh current method because this is kind of easy. It's got a current source of, you know, the answer. And in the end, we really need the current. So might be better off selecting this one. So I'll go ahead and select that one. Uh, that means we have to identify the meshes. I got a mesh here. I got a mesh here. I got a mesh here. So I've got an I1. I got an I2 and I got an I3. So all I have to do is I got to write the KVL equations for each one. I write a KVL in I1 and that would be minus 20 plus J200 I1 plus, in this case actually, is minus, minus J5 thousand times i2 minus i i'm sorry i1 my because we have an i1 equal to zero then we're going to do a kvl at i2 well goody this is a nice one because this current's an outer shell they already got within a current we already know that i2 is equal to that so no need to write any equations we've got 70.7 plus j 70.7 milliamp and then finally, we need to do a KVL at I3. And if you do that, then we've got, okay, if you do a KVL at I3, we've got minus J60 times I3 minus I2. Okay, so then we go around and we've got plus 20 I3 equal to zero. We know what I2 is. There's only I3 and I2 in here. We know Ix is equal to I3. So all we have to do is clean up. If we clean this up, we've got 20 minus J60 I3. And I2 can go on the other side and become minus 60 times I2. But we know what I2 is. I2 is 70.7 plus J70.7. Remember, we had milliamps, so when the answer comes out, the answer is going to be milliamp. So I is going to be minus J60 times 70.7 plus J70.7. The whole thing is divided by 20 minus J60. And if I did my calculations right, and this should be capital I actually, I, because we're in a phasor domain, I is going to be equal to 84.8 plus J42, or I can write that as 94.8 angle of 26.6 degree. Perfect. My job is not quite done. They were so this is I3, which is really Ix in phasor domain. They were asking for Ix. So I have to convert that back to time domain. And in order to do that, I remember that the omega was 2000. So I3 of t, the maximum is right here. 94.8 cosine the omega is 2000 so 2000 t and the angle shift is 26 degrees 
and there is the answer. As you can see of all the work done here, they're, they're pretty much similar activity that you did for resistive circuit. The only difference is they're only there. You only dealt with real numbers. Here you have to deal with complex numbers. So now we can we can basically solve R or all of our RLC circuit. We got how many branches, how many capacitors, how many inductors, how many sources they have, and we can apply all these great techniques such as um, mesh current, node voltage, source transformation, superposition, uh, Thevenin equivalent, and uh, Norton. All of that can be applied. To any of these circuits just remember there's three steps that you have to follow step one you got to convert everything to a phaser second decide which one of the technique you're going to apply with and finally if they need it into if they need the answer in time domain you find the answer in phaser domain you got to convert it back to be completely correct okay that brings us to the end of this uh, video um,